Nepal. 37 plus foreign relations. Knowing them more. Appreciating the efforts of ambassadors, plenipotentiaries, envoys, and head of mission. Welcome to Their Excellencies. Welcome to Their Excellencies. Thank you so much for your time, Excellency. And with your permission, I want to start the program. Thank you so much. Excellency, four years in Nepal. So what was the overall experience? How do you find Nepal? How do I find Nepal? Now I'll be talking, how do I personally find Nepal? Exactly. Nepal has been a lovely experience. I can tell you very honestly, not as a diplomat or because I'm supposed to perform my ambassadorial role. But personally, I feel Nepal has been a very, very remarkable and a wonderful place. What did you find beautiful about Nepal? The best thing about Nepal is the people of Nepal. The thing that I love most, because you see, they're one of the friendliest people I've seen in the world. The f one of the most friendliest people. They're very resilient, very principled. And I would say, in four years that I lived over here, I, they never let me feel that I'm in a foreign country. So what could be friendlier than that? And as a diplomat, as an ambassador, I can say it, that this is the strongest relation that can exist between two countries. The strongest relation. There's nothing stronger than that. The people to people connection. The people to people connection. I can, I recall, I attended one of these, uh, not one, but actually many, of these competitions of the South Asian Games last year. Right? And at one competition where public was very much uh, charged, the Nepali young, young boys from Nepali, and not one, two, but many, the entire employer, they were waving huge Pakistani flags, huge Pakistani flags, and cheering a Pakistani team. Now, the, I can forget many things, but I can't forget that one scene, that one, those huge flags. Now, you have asked me personally, let me share you with you a personal experience some 25 years ago. Once, I was, when I was posted in Turkey in 1990, late 90s, I lost my way and went out of the city. That was before the time of the GPS system. So it was a real problem, how do I go back? And I asked one of the policemen over there, that how do I go to this place? And he looks at me and he says, which country are you from? And I told him I'm from Pakistan. And he said, oh, Kardesh, which means then you are our brother. And for Pakistan, he said, I will not let you go like that because you will get lost again. So just follow me. He escorted me on his motorcycle to almost my home. Now, 25 years down the line. The memory is still fresh. The memory is still fresh. And with a photographic description. I have forgotten the tables and the figures that I saw yesterday. But I haven't forgotten that one experience. Coming back to Nepal. I saw those young people waving Pakistani flag and supporting Pakistani team. That image, that impression, I can recount and I can call, recall even after 30 years if I'm alive by then. But that is gone into the permanent memory. So that is what I say, we, that is my impression of Nepal and its people. It's not without reason that I say that one of the most friendliest people I've ever seen. So besides people, what do you find interesting in Nepal, Excellency? 
Definitely. You also have mountains, so we have mountains. We do, have plenty. Do Nepalese mountains still charm you? Well, they do. They do charm. Mountains charm me, and uh, the culture of Nepal, the kind of harmony that exists over here. In Kathmandu, you see, you have so many different communities. Each community celebrating its own festivities, but the way harmonious way that the Nepali people live with perfect harmony, synchronization, no issues, no problems, tolerance. That is a remarkable feature of Nepal and that is the culture of Nepal. Excellency, I, I usually uh, ask this question, this is a general question. How is the life of a diplomat? Life of a diplomat, it's an interesting life. It's a very interesting life. I've been in this uh, profession for 30 years and what I kind of like about it is personally you live at, a, at any given, um, in any given country for two to four years and that is the time that you need to actually understand or get the, what you call the feel of the country. If you have just seen one museum, one palace and one kind of uh, a shopping mall in a city, I don't think you have actually had the real feel. In two to four years of stay, you can actually, you interact with the people, you interact with the leadership, you interact with the uh, most uh, important and uh, noted people, you interact with the common people. You get a chance to chat with the cab driver and the barber and the shopkeeper and so that But is it, is, is it not you. exhausting sometimes? Too much of experience, too much of exposure. Is it not boring? I've had six postings and I can have six more. It's not boring because it's new every time. And then you have a whole, everything falls into your mandate. One day you are working on political relations, the other day you are working on trade relations, another day you are working on media. So the diversity of job, that is what makes it interesting. Excellency, how does it feel to an ambassador to, to, to have this feeling about representing the whole nation in, in a foreign nation? What kind of responsibility and what, what kind of pride does it actually give? It's a real player and an honor because then you are representing, say in case of Pakistan, 210 million people. And it's a huge, big honor that the country has bestowed upon us. And it becomes a player when you work with your friends like in Nepal. How tough is this responsibility? You get used to it. You get used to it. And you start enjoying working in different uh, sectors because when you represent the whole nation, all areas, trade, economy, people to people, contacts, uh, political relations, they fall under your mandate. Excellency, do you personally feel you know, what would have been the alternate profession if you were not an ambassador? Journalism, for sure. Journalism? Absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt if I would, weren't a diplomat, I would have loved to be a journalist. Because that is another area which gives you diversity of work. Now, going to Pakistan, how, how, what is a normal day for a citizen in Pakistan? Not the day really. begins early, the day begins late. That depends on where you are living. If you are living in a village, the day begins early. But if you are living in Karachi, they have their own culture. They sleep late at night and the day starts a bit late. But in terms of culture and way of life, Pakistani people are not very different from the Nepali people. In terms of their culture, habits, there are similarities even between the language, common words. I don't know Nepalese, but I can still make out 30-40% when Nepali is being taught. That is all because of the... And obviously that goes back to the roots which are thousands of years old. True. What doesn't let me feel a foreigner in that country, in the Nepal, it has got roots in thousands of years. You look at the history of Lombini, you look at the history of uh, Texila and see how these cultures and these people have been linked in the past. 
So life in Pakistan, it's good, yeah. That's one thing that you, frankly speaking, miss as a diplomat because you stay away from your country and your own brothers, sisters for long periods. So that's, I would say, the downside or the cost of being a diplomat. A lot of praise about Pakistani food, the delicacies, the sweets and the non-vegetarian preparations. So, did you miss Pakistani food in Nepal or did there were uh, some, some complimentary options? Well, I also like Nepali food. I like dal bhat. I like momo. But yes, as for Pakistani food, there are many places in Nepal where it's available at almost all big um, restaurants and hotels. And above all, it's available at my home. I would love to have host you over. Sure. So, so if, if I am in Pakistan or if any of Nepali's uh, friends are in Pakistan, what is one dish that you would recommend they, should, they must have? They one should, or dish? They, they should not miss. Well, then I will tell you my favorite dish. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I love chicken kadai. Chicken kadai? Yeah. Pakistani chicken kadai. Pakistani chicken kadai. Wow. Now, coming to Nepal-Pakistan relations excellency. So now we are celebrating 60 years of uh, formal relations. So this 60 years, how do you summarize this 60 years? Well, first thing is that Nepal-Pakistan formal diplomatic relations, they are 60 years old. They were established in 1960. These 60 years have been a remarkable journey of friendship. In international relations, do you don't find many examples where bilateral relations do not have any differences or disputes or differences or issues. And Nepal-Pakistan relations are one example. It has been flowing seamlessly. They're, they're flowing seamlessly. It doesn't happen very frequently. When I interact with Nepali foreign ministry or other ministries, we are always talking about how to increase cooperation. Right. We never have to discuss how to kind of settle the issues. So that is a player for a diplomat because he has, it's a, there are no issues or disputes. So what are the main milestones that you would like to reflect uh, on this journey of six year, uh, 60 years? In these 60 years, every day has been a milestone if you ask me. If you ask me, every day has been a milestone. That's a very diplomatic answer. Well, that's the realistic answer. <laughs> every day has been a milestone. Because this, um, what I said, that we don't have any issues or disputes. And we are always looking at positively towards each other. Particularly in times of calamities. Yeah. Right. Particularly in times of calamities. In times of problems, we are together. We are together and we feel the pain of each other. When you had an earthquake in 2015, April, people in Pakistan were very, very sad. They were concerned and worried. So what, what, what made them concerned about an earthquake which had happened in a different country? That is the bond that I say is remarkable every single day of it. Every single day of it. What do people in Pakistan think about Nepal? What comes to their mind when they hear the word Nepal? Well, that's an interesting question. They feel that it's a very friendly country with whom they share their culture, history, literature, music and the common roots. That is what every Pakistani knows about Nepal. But when you say that, how do they look at Nepal? There is definitely a need and the requirement that Nepal is projected more in Pakistan. People have a very good sentiment, but probably the level of awareness about uh, this beautiful country, that level is not as high as I would want it to be. Excellency, I, I did some research and uh, I found that despite, despite the presence of an active economic or touristic or any other correlation or exchange, there is a very interesting bond between people to people. 
So what what is this X factor? How do you define this X factor? What made it so unconditionally beautiful relation? Well, I've been here for four and a half years and looking for that X factor. I couldn't find it. But for sure, that bond exists. That bond exists. And uh, even when I talk to Nepali friends who are one generation elder to us, even they realize that bond. Perhaps, perhaps, it is the cultural roots that bring us together. Cultural but, but what is that cultural root? Because if you see, there were not much of exchanges in terms of the cultural ties or in a, the festivals are not common. So if you, if you try to find, you know, what is the, what is the end of that route? It's very difficult to find it or, or, or end it in any, any component per se. So is it tourism? Is it, uh, is it trade? Is it, uh, you know, religion? So what, what is it that we are so close and we feel special when we meet each other? Well, when you talk of cultural roots, we need to look at the heritage. Right. When I say we have heritage and historical links of thousands of years. Incidentally, Lumbini has been one of my most favorite places in Nepal. One place where I've been thrice and I would love to go there again. When I go to Lumbini, I go to Kapilvastu and the tour guide tells me that this part of was, was kind of studied and worked on by a Pakistani archaeologist, A.S. Dhani. A.S. Dhani Saab, the late A.S. Dhani, he is the person and the archaeologist, a very renowned archaeologist, who worked, in, who did an immense and an immaculate job on Texla. Both these cities, they were kind of contemporary cities. They went into, they kind of disappeared from the history screens almost together and they were rediscovered together at around the same time and using the same uh, evidences. So, when I say we have cultural roots, it is beyond the general radar it of is time. Beyond. And I always say that our formal diplomatic relations were established 60 years ago. But the relations between people to people, they are thousands of years old. If somebody tells me that those relations are just 60 years old, when I land at Kathmandu airport, it doesn't take me too long to connect my thinking to the way the Nepalis are thinking. It kind of immediately clicks. And then the fact that uh, we never had any issues. So the people of Pakistan never had heard anything from Nepal coming against Pakistan. So that is a big strength. But then that is what we know, what our responsibility is to project it to the wider public, to project it to the wider public. What do you find missing in this relationship except trade? Because if we go through the numbers, despite of such a beautiful harmonious relationship, the trade figures are not that great. Actually, they are very insignificant. Uh, sorry for the word, but that, that's what numbers communicate. And uh, even the tourists, except for few student exchanges and uh, few few other investments in like uh, finance and few other sectors the trade ties haven't been as productive as they should have been is it by compulsion or by choice obviously it's not by choice you use the word missing i would put it in a positive connotation i would say what needs to be done to increase the trade and all these things Great Pakistan, Nepal, there are two things. Number one, it definitely is not commensurate with the level of political relations or the level of warmth that the two people have. Right? It's not commensurate. So what needs to be done? It needs to be increased. We, every year we organize a Made in Pakistan exhibition. It's organized here in Kathmandu and it is popular among the Nepali people. I would very much like to see a Nepali made in Nepal exhibition being organized in Pakistan. 
more and more businessmen should come to each other's countries and interact. This uh, Joint Business Council was formed in 1996 between Federation of uh, Nepalese Industries and uh, the Pakistani counterparts. But why, why these kind of councils that are formed? They, they are not as active as they should have been. Very correct. They should be more active. There should be more cooperation in the industry. There should be more cooperation between the tradesmen. It must be deactivated and actually this was a part of the plan the, of the 60th year celebrations that in 2020 we had the 60th year celebration and we had planned lots of activities. Those activities included also the Joint Business Council meeting and it would have been held in 2020 if it were not for the COVID-19. So suddenly all attention shifted to the we, have, we have so many years to come, but still there are a lot of scholars who, who got scholarship from Pakistan. They studied in Pakistan and they came back. Is there an, didn't you feel a need for an alumni of people who studied in Pakistan and, and they can actually, because they know Pakistan already and they are in Nepal. So don't you think this kind of people would be even better trade ambassadors to nurture this exchange? Yeah. See, most of these people, they, well, these, uh, those who have been educated or trained in Pakistan, they are a very, very strong bridge between the two countries, a very strong bridge. And the, if I count the number, probably it would be more than four or five thousand, th uh, thousand friends from Nepal who had been educated in Pakistan, so, all so trained in what Pakistan. held us from, you know, climbing these bridges? And most of them are doctors and embassy remains in very close touch with them. And in fact, they have been so supportive. Every year we organize these two Pakistan embassy medical camps. One is in Kathmandu, the other is in some rural area. And every year it is those doctors who had received their education in Pakistan. It is they who actually provide the impetus to it. They come from their places of work, free of cost, see the patients, free of cost, and then provide a follow-up for six months, free follow-up. So that is, shows how strong those bridges are. And they, the embassy remain in touch. But then, when people but go... Aren't, to, aren't the scope of work uh, too limited? Don't you think they deserve uh, even bigger platform for performance. The one geographical problem is that most of those who are who were educated in Pakistan are now scattered in Nepal. So physically it becomes very difficult to organize something. Those who are in Nepal are who, those who can find it convenient. Almost every year we organize a kind of get together for them. This year obviously for COVID reasons we couldn't do that. But yes, you are very right. I do agree with you that that alumni should be a stronger mechanism to bring all those people together. And obviously that will strengthen the bridge. We'll work on that. Excellency, I, I love traveling countries and I love Pakistan. But why haven't I still gone to Pakistan for tourism? Well, that was my question to you. You asked it before I could. Yesterday I was looking at uh, your social media. I was surfing you on the internet. And I found out that you have been to 17 countries. And that didn't include Pakistan. So my question to you is why didn't you go to Pakistan? <laughs> but so, uh, it's of course in my plan. Combine, but uh, I, I'm more talking about a phenomena as to, you know, I'm, I'm a great food lover and I know Pakistan has very interesting delicacies. But still, what is stopping Nepalese people to travel neighboring countries than for, for tourism? Because if you see these days during our festival time and during uh, vacations, we have also started going abroad. Yeah. But why, why do our neighboring countries don't fall in our uh, consideration set? Well, Mr. Nupanthi, 
a physical or logistic issue is that unfortunately we do not have direct flights. If there were a direct flight between say Lahore to Kathmandu or between Islamabad to Kathmandu, it would be less than two hours. But now if you want to go, you have to transit at one of the Malaysia transit, or, yeah, the, or in the Middle Gulf East or country, in yes. Abu Dhabi or somewhere. So these flights were not feasible, but at least a symbolic flight. This, this question also remains to the Nepalese government. At least once a month or once in 15 days, I'm sure the, the seat would, seats would be occupied and oh, would yes. be connected. Absolutely. If, even if it's an alternate day flight, the seats would be occupied. And I fully agree Excellency, with you. Excellency, are you planning to do something about it? Well, the government of Pakistan is working on some proposals. But at the same time, we have also uh, proposed to the Nepali Airlines that to consider some direct flight. We are working on that. And I'm very, I 100% agree with you. We should have direct flight because if you don't have direct flight, the businessmen find it difficult to go. The cultural delegations don't go. The tourists don't go. I mean, it becomes difficult. So if a direct flights, there are 100 people who would travel, probably with a transit in between, much less number would travel. So I fully agree with you. We should have direct flights. It's two hours, less than two hours actually. Excellency, in these four years, what has been your interesting accomplishments as a as ambassador of Pakistan in Nepal? Well, interesting accomplishment. Uh, count one, right? I wouldn't call it really accomplishment. And let me also give you a background of it, right? When you see so many gestures of friendship from the people of Nepal, right? You feel that you are obliged to reciprocate, particularly as an ambassador, to convey that message that well, we have similar feelings for you and you have to demonstrate that. I, one of the areas on which I kind of put my efforts or I tried to do that, I don't know how far I've been successful, is to convey that message of friendship through public diplomacy. Right. So today, not that I started these things, but I kind of worked for improving these, uh, these initiatives. Many of them were coming from before I came here, but I certainly wanted to strengthen them. So what does this actually mean, public diplom diplomacy? Public diplomacy means something that conveys a direct message of friendship to the public. So we have, we try to bring the youth. So what are the tools and instruments that we, we use for this? Yeah, the tools are, for example, we organize a T20 match every year, right? From 16 clubs from all over Nepal come. So those youngsters play and then we have that, uh, the whole fan fair, you know. That's now an annual event. So going directly to people? Going directly to the people. We organize student competitions in essay writings and then the debate competitions. I would very much want that now when we are Zoom and these uh, Skype meetings are a part of normal day to day, that when we organize uh, debate competitions of Nepali students, why not to have some Pakistani students too? So there could be some participants from Kathmandu and some from Islamabad or Karachi or Lahore. So that is public diplomacy, which I think is very important. Then we organize these uh, medical camps where we reach out with our message of friendship, even to the rural areas, which is kind of uh, difficult to manage. But me as ambassador, I have to convey that message to the people also. So that Excellen is a public Excellency, diplomacy. Uh, we grew up watching Pakistani serials, which were, you know, full busters of emotional emotion and drama and climax, and you know, it was very interesting. And uh, you, I, I'm sure you are aware that a few of Nepali stars were also stars in that uh, they have casted, they've been casted in Pakistani movies. Where has that gone? Is, is it still there, or it has it has faded across time? Well, in I would just look at it slightly differently. Instead of asking where has that gone, let's look at how to revive that. When I came to Nepal in 2016, 
I was surprised that most of the Nepalis or everybody whom I talked to knew about Pakistani drama serials Ankahi and Tanhaiya and all that and they were very fond of that. Exactly. Now, obviously with this YouTube and different uh, apps, things have changed. But I still believe that uh, if Pakistani drama then, no Pakistani, some of the Pakistani dramas are really they're producing some real good dramas. They, if they are screened on Nepali televisions, obviously that traditional way of uh, watching the drama it has its own value. So I think they should be done again. But for that we need a larger interaction between media. Right? We have recent. We were right now working at a um, couple of mechanisms that can work on to increase the media-to-media -media interaction. We are working on some interactions between the press councils of Nepal and Pakistan and the, uh, the press council of Pakistan and press council of Nepal. We send delegations to Pakistan so that they could actually interact with the producers and the of the dramas. So, and I'm sure if this COVID had not come, this 2020 or the 60th year celebrations, they would have included return of Pakistani dramas to Nepali screens and similarly why not Pakistani movies. So that is an area on which we need to work. And I'm sure the, 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 this uh, field has a lot of uh, potential. Excellency, coming to the economic part of dimension of this relation, what are the main areas, sectors that you see that uh, Pakistani investors would, would or could be interested in Nepal? And what Nepalese export or, uh, you know, what, what are the trade ties, priority-wise, what are the sectors that would be more rewarding in this relationship? Have we done any prospecting or mapping of it? Hey, Mr. Nepane, normally when we look at trade relations or economic relations, our focus is kind of limited to the trade in commodities. Right. With your business background, you would understand what I am trying to say better than anybody else could. Business trade in commodities is a very, very small area. Right. I am happy that you use the word investment and then there is a huge um, services sector where there is immense scope. I can tell you in Pakistan-Nepal trade relations or in economic ties, services sector is far more promising than the trade than the commodity sector not that i'm trying to run down the importance of commodities so by services you mean hospitality and uh, wellness hospitality wellness information technology consultancies because for trade for example in information technology or software sector distance is not the matter Distance doesn't matter. And now with after COVID, even the use of information technology that has offered many, many big opportunities. This Zoom and teleconferencing, okay, the technologies were available even before COVID. But with the COVID now, these have become a part of our daily routine. Right. So, Excellency, I want to make it very specific. So, I am a Nepali trader and I want to do some business with Pakistan. So, what would you advise me uh, at, a, at a very open platform? These are the sectors that, because now you understand Nepal and you've, uh, you know Pakistan better than uh, many of us. So, what would be your advice for me if I am a Nepali businessman? What would be your advice for me uh, for investments? For investments or trade, for trade in Nepal, there are because we import, uh, we import in billions, and the 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 import from Pakistan is not that significant. So, what are, where, where do you actually see a low hanging fruits that we can immediately start? If you talk of low hanging, let's first talk of the exports to Nepal, exports to Pakistan. Pashmina shawls are very very popular in Pakistan. Pashmina shawls are Nepali pashmina shawl. Pakistani ladies love that. And also even the gents when it comes to those Pashmina mufflers. That is one area. 
then there are several other smaller areas like cardamom and other products. So the scope is there. As for Pakistani imports to Nepal, the, way, the, the one good indicator of what can be imported to Nepal is this made in Pakistan exhibition. Because these are the sectors or the imports which are tried, tested year after year. So which are the most famous stalls in this uh, exhibition? They are leather. Leather. Leather items. Good quality leather items. Dry fruits? Dry fruits? Dry fruits. Then there are these uh, ladies suits. They are very popular in Nepali ladies. Of course. The branded ones, they are very popular. And I w absolutely have no doubt that if they are imported to Nepal, they will find a huge market. Then there are cer uh, ceramics, onyx, and even wooden furniture. I'm, I was surprised how is wooden furniture, but every day it comes, particularly the decorative furniture. So there are many areas. What is needed is for the businessmen of the two countries to interact. And what the governments or the embassy can do is to bring the two businessmen together. Once they interact with each other, they can see at the market with the eye of a businessman which a diplomat can't have. But Made in Pakistan Expo is a very interesting tool for that uh, matchmaking. And uh, right, like you suggested, uh, Made in Nepal Expo in Pakistan would, would even be a better uh, matchmaking up here. And as ambassador, I can assure you that we at the embassy would be 100% supportive of any such move. We would be very happy to connect Nepali businessmen with Pakistani businessmen. So through this television, you want uh, to send an open invitation for Nepalese to organize Made in uh, Absolutely. Nepal Expo Absolutely. In and I can say it on screen that we would be very much supportive of any such move. And we would make all efforts that it becomes a success. I, by the way, can I ask you one thing? Please. You have a business plus television. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be asking you a question because you are interviewing me. You have a Business Plus Television. Why doesn't Business Plus Television interact with the business related media houses in Pakistan? And I can again offer, uh, commit it on screen, that if you plan any such move, we would facilitate it to the best of our capacity. That's a very interesting proposition, Excellency, and I really Please thank, think you. Over it. thank you for that. Please think over this it. This actually uh, creates a new, new platform to have a cross-country media connection wherein we, we can feed a lot of things about Pakistan and, and about Nepal. And if you think it's viable and it, if it works, I as ambassador will have done my job. Thank you so much. I, I will take take lead on this and, and immediately start. That's really interesting. So I think this is how things grow. So Excellency, to sum our conversation, I, you, you think that uh, services could be a very interesting sector for Pakistan investors for business in Nepal. Absolutely. And, uh, and there are a lot of export and import opportunities, especially in terms of import, leather and, uh, and furnitures. And, Absolutely. And in terms yeah. of export, pashmina, uh, pashmina and uh, all the other handicrafts and cardamom. So this, this could be interesting areas to explore. Yeah, but again, I would stress the most promising area is the services sector, services. whether it's hospitality or consultancies or even construction. These are huge areas. Pakistani lawyers are globally recognized. Yeah. Very competent. Absolutely. All areas are open to, because there the distance doesn't matter. So, Excellency, uh, now going to the reason, uh, Nepal-Pakistan relation, how much is it dependent on other neighbors? Let's discuss about SART neighbors. Is it, is it an interrelated relation or we have a separate relation and there is a new uh, you know, ecosystem which harmonizes this relation? Well, these are two different things. One are the bilateral relations and the second is the multilateral relations. Bilateral relations, obviously, they are maintained on the basis of bilateral, uh, on the bilateral platform. As for the multilateral, it's basically the SARC. When you come to this region in the context of Nepal-Pakistan relations, it basically comes down to SARC. And SARC is a very, very useful 
and an important vehicle of regional cooperation. Are we making use of this vehicle? Proper use of this vehicle? If you ask the proper use, no. Right. We need to energize it, reactivate it, and make it more useful. And what we need to do at, at the moment is what SARC needs is to have the impetus at the highest level, which is the SARC summit. The SARC summit, which was to be held in 2016, but it couldn't be held because of uh, some unfound, baseless allegations and all that, you know, holding a multilateral, multilateral economic, regional cooperation agenda hostage to bilateral allegations. That doesn't work. Right? What needs to be done is, uh, the first thing is to attach importance to regional cooperation. Right? And to attach regional cooperation, keep it separate from bilateral issues and have a mindset of cooperation. Right. When all the countries have it, things would work. Pakistan has always wanted to have regional cooperation. If you look at Pakistan's policies over the last 10 years, we are now connected in almost all directions except for in the east. With, with the north, we have China. And I don't think I need to elaborate the kind of uh, friendship we have with that great country and the scale and magnitude and the importance of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So that go, I mean, I'll be repeating the obvious if I go into those details. We all know it. Yeah. We are wanting to connect to South Asia, to West Asia. And Gawadar port is providing an excellent avenue, again, a part of CPEC. We are wanting to link ourselves to the Central Asia because if you look at the location of Pakistan, it kind of straddles on different regions, West Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, in the North it is China. We would also want to have regional economic cooperation eastwards in the SARC region. You think SARC, uh, SARC is a very interesting vehicle and it can, uh, it can bring in regional uh, cooperation to a different level. Yeah, it has the potential. It has the potential. Definitely. If it is... It has still not become redundant. No, the vehicle remains there. But we need to inject a will to cooperate. That's what I would say. Excellency, I, would, I found it very interesting. You have written this book, Chess Board of WTO, Developing Countries Perspective. So, can you give us a quick abstract of this book? Yes, Board of WTO, I wrote it in 2006, some 14 years ago. Economics and international trade, these relations, these have always been an area of my special interest. I like it. Chess Board of WTO was about the relationship between the developed countries and the kind of uh, rights or the space that the developing countries were wanting at that time. This was immediately after the WTO uh, Conference, ministerial conference in Hong Kong. At that time I was in Hong Kong. So I was a part of the delegation. So all the deliberations I saw that. That chessboard of WTO is basically about these rights or the different uh, the space that the developing countries require. The less privileged countries, the space, so that there is an even playing field in the international. Since you men mentioned this word chessboard, so who are the two kings at the two sides of this board? Well, there are more than 100 kings. In nine, 2006, I think there were 134 uh, pieces. And the kings, uh, you can call anybody a king, but basically it is a chessboard of WTO revolves around the balance or the level playing field between the developing and the developed countries. So, w where does the balance, the, the fulcrum the, of the balance remain? The way I look at it, obviously, I would want to have more uh, space for the developing countries. Not just because I come from a developing country, but even if you look at the rules from a neutral point, the trade rules, I think developing countries need an even playing field. Is there a fair justice in, 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 uh, in equal trade participation between developed and developing countries? I would not use the word justice, 
but certainly the rules must be more even playing fair. more fair more fair that is all the debate about doha round and subsequent debates and the trading system is about particularly when it comes to the issues of agricultural subsidies when it comes to the issues of uh, now those are finished but the import quotas and even to the smaller issues of uh, the space that um, intellectual property rights uh, occupies how those rules are implemented the pharmaceuticals all these issues and it's a long discussion but basically developing countries i felt then and i feel now should have a living level playing field and level playing field requires more space being provided to them in this context as author of this book uh, i'm not asking your excellency but you as a person what would be your suggestion for nepal in in the in the context of this wto should we not be too obsessed about uh, or excited about it or should we see it skeptically or how, how should we see the wto uh, the whole network wto rules are not an option it's just there and one has to but the degree to which to which you admit it if you are a member you are admitted to it and there is little flexibility you can play around with the uh space to, available to a particular country but obviously so still and, what would be your suggestion as as author my suggestion to all developing countries would be number one to understand the actual dynamics of that chessboard to understand the actual dynamics of that chessboard and then they should have a voice they should have a voice which kind of encompasses or reflects the aspirations of the developing countries but for, to get their right they have a the wto rules are to be honest like a labyrinth thing difficult to understand and complicated in their nature with many many dimensions so my suggestion to all developing countries is to have the best possible understanding of the rules so that the space available within that can be utilized in in a collective forum the synchronized voice can be interesting so my my my, my concluding question excellency uh, what is the future of this relationship between nepal and pakistan the future future of this relation is 2030 where do you see it going nepal pakistan relations as i said they have a beautiful history right and no very tense so i have all the reason to be optimist i have all the reason to be optimist to that optimism i would add that these technological developments they have made the job easier and opened more avenues and broadened many avenues that were already there but they have kind of provided more space to build these relations do you see the regional tides taking us a little bit farther course of time regional tides well when you talk of region right this region is constantly changing it's constantly changing if you compare it to the south asia of 10 years ago it's certainly not the same right so the dynamics would be comp- may be completely different the dynamics would be different 20 years ago there was no bri 10 years ago there was no bri right at that time connectivity northwards whether it's for pakistan or china or nepal northwards connectivity was had very limited options just 10 years ago even right? today so, so new things completely new, new things. transforming things may the dynamics of south asia it's changing 10 years down the line many of the geographical limitations that uh, the mountains in the north both in pakistan and nepal had posed the trans himalayan that connectivity issues are lowering by, day by day are you happy with the political relationships or exchanges that we are having between pakistan and nepal yes well they are not sufficient we should have more if you ask 
if I'm happy with the relation uh, with the political exchanges, I'm happy with those which have taken place. But I think there is space for more. We should have more political exchanges at the highest level and at all levels to make these exchanges commensurate with the kind of warmth and the relief friendship that we have and also to explore the full potential of these relations. We need to have a different mindset now right? and have more political exchanges which are also give visibility to these relations as well as substance. So I am happy with the relations that have, uh, with the visits that are taking place but I am unhappy about the visits that are not taking place. Okay. And uh, one again, coming back to the life of a diplo diplomat, uh, how is the life of a retired diplomat? Like you, you, I'm sure you have a lot of friends who have re retired recently. So how do they spend their life? I'll be able to answer that question maybe better after five or ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, send it my, I'll send you my answer. But you see, the life of a retired diplomat is basically, he has experience that is back and he can use it I think once I retire I think I would become a journalist because that is a passion that I had since the beginning I couldn't become. So pursue the things that you were not able to pursue. Absolutely. Complete yourself. Complete. As a diplomat you, have, you do what the office routine tells you to do but after retirement you can do what you actually want to do. And with uh, this experience, I think you can be a good um, analyst. You can write in these things. And that is what I think I'll do. But as I said, I'll be able to answer that question better after five or ten years. I'll interview you again, Excellency. Definitely. And uh, I'll invite you to Pakistan. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, any message to the Nepalese audience who is watching us on television right now? It's a message of love, friendship. And thanks for hosting me for so long and without making me feel that I'm a foreigner in your country. Thank you so much for your time, Excellency. Thank you so much. Nepal, 37 plus foreign relations. Knowing them more, appreciating the efforts of ambassadors, plenipotentiaries, envoys, and head of missions. Welcome to Their Excellencies.